Welcome everyone on today's webinar, which will be held by Christopher Hohn from the Center for Continuous Flow Synthesis and Processing from University of Graz, Austria. Today, he will talk about process intensification and ozonolysis reactions using dedicated continuous flow equipment, which features Thales Nano's ozone module. After the presentation, you will be able to ask your questions in the chat box, or you can send them directly to us at askthechemist at talesnano.com. Now, let me hand you over to Christopher. Enjoy the presentation. Hello, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Christopher Hone. I'm from the Center for Continuous Flow Synthesis and Processing, CC Flow, at the Research Center for Pharmaceutical Engineering. We're based in Graz in Austria. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the use of ozone as a reagent in organic synthesis um, and in particular ozonolysis reactions and how you can do them within continuous flow technologies. So I'll give you a general overview to begin with of this type of chemistry and then I'll talk more specifically about a research case from our group. So ozone is a naturally occurring uh, molecule. It forms from molecular oxygen within the atmosphere by the action of ultraviolet light and electrical discharges. It's very unstable and it also has many commercial applications as well. Um, so many of which I'm sure you're familiar with and the one that we're most interested in is naturally organic synthesis, so oxidation type chemistry and also uh, the use of ozone for performing alkene, al alkyne and aromatic cleavage type reactions. Um, so ozone itself, it's um, got a bent type structure, so it's got a similar structure to water. Um, ozone is a, a, a gas with a very pungent odour, it's pale blue in colour. And one thing that I'm sure we all know about is it's, very, it's a very toxic gas as well, so it's very dangerous to health, so it needs to be very carefully handled. In terms of its drawbacks within batch vessels, so this sort of is the these are the drivers of why then we would want to perform the uh, this type of chemistry within continuous flow technologies, is that the accumulation of ozone within the headspace and within the liquid phase of um, batch reactors uh, is very dangerous. We also have the ozonide um, intermediate that forms with this chemistry that undergoes a very exothermic decomposition. So this needs to be very carefully controlled. We are operating with organic solvents and uh, within these systems, we have very oxygen rich atmospheres. Um, so there's the potential for flammability. Um, because we need to carefully control the temperature, then we uh, use uh, cryogenic conditions, um, which um, can be quite challenging to handle in terms of um, accessing those lower temperatures, particularly at scale. Because we want to try and minimise um, many of the exothermic intermediates, then we operate this type of chemistry at low concentrations. Um, we also need an excess of gas, so this is quite inefficient. And then as we go to large scales, we have quite a small interfacial area and then reactions can become mass transfer limited. So all of these aspects then clearly lead to scaling difficulties. Um, so the type of chemistry that you can do. So at the top, we have an uh, alkene uh, based uh, reaction with ozone. And then the nice thing about this chemistry depending on the quenching reagent use so the workup conditions we can actually access quite a number of different products so it gives us quite a uh, quite a uh, quite in interesting mo molecules uh, ranging from alcohols to uh, ketones and aldehydes and then also acids and in general these reactions are quite um, Highly, they're highly selective and also provide high yield. Um, and in, they are quite green as well in terms of that the only stoichiometric byproducts that we form from these reactions are oxygen and water. So there are 
potential benefits, even though there are limitations when it comes to handling the chemistry in terms of the safety. Um, and again, this is just a mechanism to show that from the intermediate that we observe, then this can exothermically, uh, this, this decomposition of this uh, can be quite exothermic. Um, so just turning now to give you an overview of what's already been done within continuous flow. So the first example for it was from uh, Jensen within a micro reactor uh, back in 2006. This was, um, so in this study, uh, they basically paved the way to show that it was possible to do this. Uh, perhaps uh, the main uh, take home message um, is that it's very difficult to achieve high throughputs within uh, this type of system. Uh, then so, uh, subsequently, uh, Stephen Lay's group looked at just using T pieces uh, for performing ozonolysis reactions. And this works very well because generally these reactions occur very quickly. So on the second to millisecond timescale, the problem comes is when you want to scale this chemistry up within a tea mixer, then you need larger diameters and uh, you can, it can be hard to predict how then the chemistry will perform at large scale and how do you uh, thermally manage uh, the system. Um, also, uh, an earlier example from our own group uh, using tubular capillary type uh, reactors to perform this chemistry. Um, again, this has limited. This had the same limitation in terms of it was a relatively low throughput, um, and it's very difficult to scale from this kind of uh, reactor for a gas liquid type reaction. And then um, uh, Stephen Lay's group also reported um, the use of um, ozone within tube in tube reactors. This is a very interesting approach whereby. Um, there's a, a tube within a tube with the middle tube uh, is constructed of a semi-permeable membrane which allows passage of the gas through but doesn't allow passage of liquid so it means you have your gas in your um, allows the passage of um, ozone through um, which means that then you don't have a gas liquid uh, system within one compartment. So the, the ozone is all dissolved within the liquid phase, which makes it safer to handle. Um, also loop reactors have been reported whereby the uh, liquid feed is recirculated through the reactor. Uh, this can be quite useful uh, for operation at, at scale. Uh, continuous stirred tank reactors, again, another solution for operating at scale. Um, the ozone needs to be carefully uh, kept below certain levels. So that's a challenge because a, a CSCR in some ways has similarities to batch type reactors, but it does give the potential for scale up th by continuously flowing through, through your liquid feed. And then very recently, um, a, a, an approach whereby silicon dioxide um, columns were used to enable a solvent free uh, synthesis without um, uh, uh, for uh, ozonolysis reactions. So the main limitations of this type of chemistry is that in general you see quite low space-time yields and there's often issues related to mass and heat transfer. So any, any approaches that can try and address this um, can um, clearly help uh, in terms of scalability, but these are all excellent uh, examples of um, how ozone has been used as a reagent for organic reactions within continuous flow. Um, so here is our general setup in terms of we have oxygen, which then passes through uh, an ozone generator to form um, ozone. And we have our liquid feed, which is introduced uh, via a pump. Uh, and then this fl flows through uh, a, um, a micro reactor. So in this case, a Lanza flow plate manufactured from uh, by Airfault. And then at the end of the reactor, we have our quenching feed. And then this flows into a vessel which uh, has a nitrogen purge and an exhaust gas to ensure that um, uh, we don't have high levels of um, undesired gas. So on the right hand side, we have the set up as a picture in terms of having the thermostat. We have a serious 
syringe pump for introduction of the liquid feed, the flow plate here. Uh, we have our outlet tube in here, uh, which has our vent and our, um, and our nitrogen purge. And then over here we have our Tally's Nano um, uh, ozone generator. So again, as I mentioned, an inline quench is very important to ensure that um, we don't see the accumulation of um, uh, potentially um, exothermic intermediates and uh, explosive environments. We want to try to operate below the flash point of, of the solvent to ensure that uh, there's not any chance um, of explosions. And then also we want to keep diluting the um, outlet vessel with uh, nitrogen gas. And then also here you can see the ozone detector. And then one thing that we always did before each experiment is to, to perform a leak test with an inert gas to ensure that um, gas wasn't um, so that the system was sealed. Um, so in terms of the Talis Nano um, system that we were using, so this can operate between 100 millilitres per minute down to one milliliter per minute, uh, and it can generate ozone concentrations between approximately um, 18 weight percent and about um, eight to nine weight percent, depending on the flow rate that you're using. Um, and it can operate up to a pressure of five to six bar. Um, so the first system that we looked at was the um, the ozonolysis of thioanosol, uh, and this can form our desired um, product, uh, and then also uh, the overreaction to uh, to our um, to 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 our side product as well. So we looked at a number of different parameters. So we looked at temperature to see the influence that ha that had. We looked at a wide range of ozone equivalents used. Uh, as you can see on the right hand side, um, as you would expect with increasing equivalents, then you have um, higher conversions. Um, one thing that's interesting is you see a uh, high conversion even below one equivalent, which indicates that it's probably a radi radical mechanism that's occurring. Uh, we also looked at gas flow rates um, along with liquid flow rates to look at the resonance time that was necessary within the system. We looked at different substrate concentrations. Uh, we looked at two different solvents, both dichloromethane and also methanol. And then we also investigated um, the reaction within a reactor plate and then also just using T-piece and tubing. And we also applied the same conditions that we identified uh, for the ozonolysis of diphenyl uh, sulfide. Um, so in terms of temperature, what's interesting is that temperature doesn't really have an influence um, in terms of the reaction performance. So at minus 30, we see 94% uh, area percent of our product. And then at 15 degrees, we see about 96% of our product. So we decided in terms of um, our focus to look at naught degrees Celsius and then also in terms of our long run naught degrees Celsius uh, because then this is operating below the flash point of our solvent. Um, yeah. And then as you can see here, we're only just using a slight excess of ozone and our residence time is uh, relatively short of only around two seconds. So uh, looking at the reactor volume and the, and the mixing and the influence that that has, so for our first experiment, we just tried it using a simple T piece and a short coil at half a second resonance time. And what's fantastic is that, as you can see, you see high conversion and high product formation. Um, so the thing that this shows is that clearly at this scale, it works very well within a T piece. Um, and then also when we take uh, the flow plate and we look at different reactor volumes here and different residence times. So at 1.7 seconds within the flow plate, then we see very high conversion and then a slight, a marginally be better area percent for our product. And then as we reduce the reactor volume by using different quench inlets, then um, 
you see that you also achieve very high conversion and comparable area percent. It's only when we go to um, very short residence time, so quenching within the first corner at Q3 within the flow plate, that then we start to see a drop in conversion and product yield. Um, so it shows that even within a short time. So in terms of scalability, even though at this scale, the T-piece and coil perform similar to the flow plate, uh, as if this was to be scaled up, then can the same mixing and thermal management be achieved within a T-piece and a coil? And the answer is uh, probably not. So which is why you would then look to perform it in a, a microreactor that could give you that, that um, careful control. Um, so we also looked at the um, the transformation within a heat flow continuous flow calorimeter, which was developed in at TU Graz um, here. So this is a picture of it on the right. Um, so um, uh, and then an, an exploded um, version of it in terms of so it uses uh, Peltier elements to um, to measure um, the, um, the the um, to, to to measure the heat of reaction. Um, so this is a bit more of a detailed schematic in terms of the way that the segments are set up. So within the first one, there's the opportunity to pre um, preheat or pre cool, and then you have two. Uh, reactor segments uh, where your two feet are mixed. Um, so it's a very similar setup to the flow plate. And then within this, then a very good calibration is necessary so that you know that, uh, uh, so you can be confident in the measurements that are taking place. So as I say, the operating at room temperature has a benefit that then you don't need to pre-cool. So you're, it's, it's a lot better in terms of um, that. And, so this is uh, this just shows the results from two separate uh, experiments that were performed. So one equivalent and one point four equivalents. And as you can see, uh, this this shows the change in voltage. Uh, uh, so this is the first set, and then here is the second set. And then based on this, uh, we could quite confidently uh, measure the heat of reaction. So minus one hundred and sixty five kilojoules per mole, which corresponds to a, an adiabatic temperature rise of 16 degrees. Uh, in terms of considering safety within ozonolysis reactions, I uh, refer people to this great publication from Corning, where they go through a lot of the different considerations that um, users uh, should consider. So, yeah, I think the thing that's very interesting within within the calorimetry experiments that were done is that we saw that all the heat was released within the first segment, uh, which corresponds to a resonance time of 0.5 um, seconds. Um, so it happens very quickly and there wasn't any any heat released in the second segment. Um, in terms of looking at the stability, we also want to show that not only does it work during our optimization, experiments that, that actually we get consistent results as we operate the process for longer. And um, we looked at it over a period of three hours and we saw uh, based on the optimum conditions that we were using, so uh, uh, around one milliliter per minute of our um, liquid feed, 70 milliliter per minute of our, um, of our um, ozone in oxygen gas and within the flow plate and then, then the quench uh, that uh, we saw very good yields in terms of almost quantitative yield and then after isolation close to 90% yield. So it shows that it, it, it works for a prolonged period of time. Um, and the thing really to stress here again coming back to the space time yield is that this offers a far better space time yield compared to earlier work that was done within a tubular reactor and also in terms of the throughput as well. Uh, because because, um, because uh, quite high because of the short resonance times that can be achieved within the uh, micro reactor. 
uh, turn into uh, slightly different chemistry in terms of the ozonolysis of cyclohexene uh, using um, so with similar conditions as for thioanosol. So we looked at a low concentration and a long residence time and saw that you could get 90% of the desired bisaldehyde. And then even at higher concentrations um, at a shorter residence time, then this led to an increase. And then when we had the quench at an earlier inlet, then we saw that they, again, in a similar manner to the thioanosol, that there was a drop in conversion and then also um, a drop in yield as well. And then at lower temperatures, uh, this provided no improvement. So you know, it's great that we can operate this process at zero degrees. And then when we changed the quench, then we saw that there was a big drop in our desired product. And then we also applied these conditions to look at different substrates uh, using methanol as well. Uh, we also looked at the substrates in dichloromethane as well, whereby we saw a, an improvement. Um, so just looking at the methanol example, so as you can probably imagine, you do see the, um, the esters formed for these substrates and then also um, the acetals as well. Um, so it's important that our desired transformation takes place before um, um, the, the reaction with uh, methanol. So it needs to be carefully uh, fine-tuned. And as I say, using di dichloromethane led to slight improvements with, with all of these yields as well. But this is not shown. Um, so here we can see uh, the improvements that we saw with dichloromethane. Uh, so um, in here, so with um, parachlorostyrene, so here, 67 to 85, and then again with uh, paramethoxystyrene, again from 50 to 70. So um, it, it could uh, uh, further improve um, our desired product. So as an overview, um, so I hope I've shown that uh, we can use continuous flow technologies to safely um, um, operate these types of processes and also it gives us the opportunity to uh, to take these processes and uh, scale them up. Um, high space time yields can be achieved uh, with this type of uh, process because of the short residence times that are possible. I also showed you that we used a 3D printed heat flow, continuous flow calorimeter from our colleagues at TU Graz to measure the heat of reaction uh, for these um, for this type of transformation. And also in terms of the, the benefit that methanol might have over dichloromethane in terms of providing a greener method, as we saw with the last examples that uh, Dichloromethane can sometimes give us a better yield depending on what product we're after. Actually, if we can use methanol instead and fine tune towards that, then that might lead to an improvement. So you can read about the research that I present within this webinar in the paper that's at the bottom. Um, and there's more details there as well. So I just would like to um, acknowledge my colleagues, uh, both at uh, CC Flow. So Dominic did the lab work, so he worked hard on that and performing the analysis as well. Uh, my uh, boss and the group leader, Oliver Kappa, and also Manuel Meyer for his support with the calorimetry experiments. I'd also like to thank um, Dominique, uh, Paul and Petteri from Lonza for their support um, throughout the project, um, studying the ozonolysis reactions. Um, and then also I'd like to thank Talis Nano as well for the opportunity to present uh, the work today and to give this webinar. So thank you very much and I'm more than happy to take any questions.
Um, so hopefully my mic is working now. Um, I'm not sure if it's working now, if someone can let me know um, if it's working. Um, so I'll just try again based on um, yeah, so I've got one question where it's, um, have you scaled up any of the reactions you presented? If so, what is the maximum throughput you've achieved? So uh, in this case, we've only um, operated at the scale you see, so within that, um, within the flow plate. Um, and what we were, we were limited basically by the um, flow rate that could be produced by the uh, the module because it's a module uh, designed for the lab scale. One thing we are looking at now is to get a, a, a an, an ozone generator that can achieve um, a high flow rate, flow rate, so a, a prototype. Um, what, what you're limited by though in terms of scaling up is the pressure drop. So in terms of what can be achieved across the plate. So if we were to scale up, um, what we'd need to be careful of is in terms of um, uh, making sure that the pressure within the system wasn't too high. Because what you find with a lot of the um, um, what you find with a lot of ozone generators is that they're not um, particularly those designed for lab lab scale. Is that they're not designed to operate at higher pressures. Um, but what we would like to do is to basically demonstrate that this is possible um, with a higher throughput. Um, because what's interesting as well is that we're pretty sure that if you, even, even within the same system, even uh, by operating at higher flow rates, we might, we will be able to achieve a slightly higher throughput um, based on the space time yields that we're achieving because even within a short um, zone within the flow plate we were able to use um, uh, we were able to achieve um, close to full conversion and very good yields um, yeah so I hope that helps to answer your question so it is something that we're looking at and we do want to demonstrate at large scales to demonstrate this idea that you can go from a small flow plate to a large flow plate and it, through maintaining similar heat transfer and mass transfer performance, then you're able to scale up and produce a higher throughput of material. Um, the vinyl imidazole didn't touch the ring. Um, yeah, so th this is this is um, this is right. So we saw that it was selective to the chemistry that we uh, were trying to do. So we didn't see. Um, uh, we did not detect um, any any cleavage of the actual uh, heterocycle itself. Um, so um, I've also got an, um, another, let me just check to see. So please feel free to write any questions. Um, um, yeah, uh, also thanks for your comments with regards to the uh, the presentation I really do appreciate it and please feel free to contact me via um, email as well if you have any future questions that you think of um, at a later time I'd be happy to discuss more and um, give you more uh, uh, more details um, so another question that I've seen as well is that um, uh, would it be possible to to exclude the quenching step from the flow line and instead collect the product uh, into the quenching liquid. Um, for instance, sodium borohydride is a solid, so it's more difficult to introduce in flow. Uh, my comment here is that, yeah, in principle, this is uh, possible to do. We we did it ourselves in terms of doing the quench within the within the collection vessel. Um, I would say it needs to be done with care, so um, safety does need to be considered. Um, for instance, the the quench of uh, the quench of the quench can be more exothermic than actually the ozonolysis reaction itself. So I think in terms of making sure that it's done at a reaction temperature where um, you're not going to get a lot of heat um, generated, 
Um, you also have to be careful in terms of the the uh, amount of oxygen and ozone present. So it does depend on the scale that you want to operate at um, because you don't want these things accumulating so much. So making sure that you're, um, you've got your nitrogen line and that there's not so much, um, there isn't the accumulation. So one thing also which we looked at is making sure that the um, the ozone um, that there isn't uh, too there is the uh, there isn't too much of an excess of ozone present within the system, and also making sure that if you're only forming small amounts at any one time, then clearly that's a lot safer than when you're operating at large scales as well. Um, yeah, so just see if there's any more questions. So please write in the chat if there are any more. Um, as you can see, and got another one as well in terms of have you tried nitrogen compounds as quenches um, such as trilithylamine or pyridine can form in oxides and therefore uh, can be suitable ozonide reducers and O3 quenches. This is this, um, yeah. So um, interestingly, we did um, we did look at N oxide formation um, uh, as part of the project. Um, so, um, what we found uh, was that actually, um, w in in our hands, we we couldn't really get the N oxide formation to to work at all. Um, but there are reports uh, under different. Um, yeah. There are reports from people um, that. Uh, it is possible to do uh, to to use these kind of things with ozone, but based on our work, so we looked at it um, for a bit of time, and we didn't really see uh, many positive results. Um, yeah. So, if there aren't any further questions, I'll just wait um, wait a few moments, um, and then I'll call the webinar to an end. So, thank you very much for attending and for your interest and. Um, uh, yeah, if you have any further questions, please feel free to get in touch. And yeah, so thank you. So I'll just wait a few moments and then um, call it to an end. Many thanks.